Hey, welcome into the Fearless Investor Podcast. You're listening to me, Kyle Stanley, uh, coming to you actually from Arizona right now in one of our brand new uh, owned Airbnbs. Really excited about this one. But as uh, we got in here, I was kind of just thinking again about what is it like to be a regular landlord? What is it like to be a short-term rentals uh, operator, not landlord, right? Because we don't have tenants, we have guests. So um, I want to just go back to a few different episodes of our show. Um, talking to a few different people that really are discussing why short-term rentals are so powerful versus doing long-term rentals. So this is a little bit of a mashup video of just this topic of why short-term over long-term, and I hope you enjoy. All right, TJ. So you've got a really cool story. Um, Let's, let's just start from the beginning. Um, yeah. You weren't even born in the U.S. You came to the U.S. Um, yeah. Take us back to before you even got started in your professional career. Yeah, yeah, man. I, you know, I, for me, I was born in Nigeria. Um, Nigeria's home. I came here when I was eight years old and with my four siblings. Uh, my mom raised us. Um, she's, the, she, yeah, she's as amazing as she sounds, yes. Um, and, and I was the first in my family to go to school, go to college and graduate. And that wasn't necessarily easy. I kind of had to work my way through school. And, um, and, but for me, I've kind of always kind of had that entrepreneurship bug, but I never actually realized it because while I was in college, Again, I had to kind of pay my own way through school. I worked, I worked at Foot Action selling shoes, and mm -hmm. so. But what I also did was I realized that they would have these crazy sales on apparel, right? Like Jordan okay. and Nike apparel, especially like Jordan shorts. Back then, like the Jordan shorts went in, like everything. So I, they would, they would have like this crazy deal, sixty percent off. Then I'll tack on my additional employee discount, which is like 30 35 percent off. I'll be buying these shorts for like five bucks, right? They retail for sixty bucks. So I would get as much. I would just clean the entire store i would get as much as i could and i would just walk into dorm rooms on campus and i went to university of houston go cougs baby um, <laughs> i went to university of houston so i would walk into the dorm rooms with just two big bags and um and i would just be selling the jordan shorts and i was selling for 25 but i bought them for five they retail for 60 i'll sell them for, for 25 and so i did That's that awesome. i did that at like probably four three or four times a month Right, and I would clean up. Like I would clean up. You were wholesaling I, without even knowing what wholesaling. I didn't was. even realize I yeah. was wholesaling. <laughs> so, so me coming graduated. Right, I graduated. Red rich dad, poor dad. Right, one of my frat mm -hmm. brothers said, "Hey, you know, you should read this book. You kind of like this. You seem like you like this entrepreneurship thing. You're yeah. such a hustler because yeah. he's been knowing me throughout my college career." And so I read this book and I said, "Well, I want to own some assets." So I got into buying whole real estate investing because I wanted to own real estate. So I got in, I, I got into a, a local real estate group that had that same focus within their strategy, which is buying hold. And I got locked in with them. And so then I started buying hold real estate on the side. Right. I graduated work, working for oil and gas company, which was great. I didn't hate my job. It just required a lot of my time. I was traveling quite a bit. I was out of town all the time. About 65 percent of the year I was working offshore, working on the rigs, working as a sub installations engineer. But when I got home, whenever I was home on my free time, I would always, always focus on real estate. Okay. So I would buy properties on the side. And so um, then I got I got uh, educated on how to wholesale. <laughs> I wholesale. So when I started getting educated on how to wholesale, I said, oh, I've been doing this. <laughs> I've been doing this. So <laughs> You already the knew wholesale. the concept. <laughs> Exactly. That's so awesome. I feel mean, those. So that's how um I, I, that's how I really got my wits about me within the real estate space. And um I still love doing buy and hold. I got really good at doing the birth strategy where we are buying these properties distressed, ugly, making them beautiful and pretty, and then we're refinancing them, pulling our cash back out, and we're doing it all over again. Then once the market kind of shifted within the oil and gas space, came twenty sixteen. Ah, uh, man. So when the price of oil is a hundred dollars, everybody's happy. Everybody's eating yeah. as a consumer, the gas, the gas, the price of gas is a little high, but that's when the economy is good <laughs> to the oil yep. and gas space. So when it dropped, uh, man, we, they pretty much didn't have any more projects for me. When I got done with my serving my portfolio, which was the Exxon mobile portfolio, um, they, they tried to move me around to a different role. Um, they, so it was just like, you know what? I went ahead and just took the severance package. Um, and because the position they wanted to me to be in would have required half my salary, but more time in the office. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and bet on myself. At the time I had about five rental properties. My goal was to get 10 rentals before I, before I left my full-time job. So it was cut short. So, but I still decided to bet on myself and I, um, I decided to go on into this real estate thing. I wasn't necessarily looking to do short-term rentals. I just okay. came across a video while I was doing market research on how to generate leads. And so I came across a video on short-term rentals. I said, huh, I'm rehabbing two houses right now. Let me try this strategy on one of these houses. 
so after I remodeled this house, I decided to put to furnish it instead of put a long term tenant in it. And Perfect. I listed yeah. it, got my we got two bookings the very next day. And when I did the math, I realized that I, I would be able to at least three X that income, even at like 50% occupancy. I was like, okay, <laughs> let me sink my teeth into the strategy. That's when I really got into the short-term rental game. And it's been life-changing for me ever since. Then I got educated on rental arbitrage. And I said, oh, wow, I don't have to own these either. <laughs> I ain't got to own them. So for me, what I like to do now is I love, I love, the, the, I love wealth building within the short-term rental space. I love the fact that you don't have to own. You can cash flow without ownership. But I love that, okay, I, I can still own it and still cash flow nicely with these properties. So, um, and, and my, my best performing properties are the ones that I own, but I still love rental arbitrage because I'm able to scale quickly and still Absolutely. earn really good cash flow doing it. So while I'm rehabbing, right, while I'm doing my remodels and I'm remodeling these, these properties, my focus has been two to four units. I'm buying two to four units, remodeling them, and then making them full-time short-term rentals in highly gentrified areas here in Houston, Texas. And that's been my focus. And so while I do that, I'm picking up rental arbitrage properties while doing the rehab process. That's how I've been able to scale my business. And it's been a heck of a journey ever since. And I think the best thing is being able to show other people how to do the same thing. So with me, you, can, you the, the different dynamic with me is like, um, we're really, really good at rental arbitrage. Right? We're really good at getting that yes from landlords to execute that arbitrage strategy. But I love the wealth building component as well. And so I like to do both and there's definitely some synergy there and it's been life changing and I haven't wholesaled a deal <laughs> since I really got into the space. So that's pretty much it for me. You have a, a great story, um, just dominated in your space and um, I'm really interested to talk about what you're doing now and, and the exit that you took um, from your properties and uh, your business, because I think that's going to be really special for our guests to hear today or our guests. Look at that. I'm in Airbnb mode, our listeners to listen to today. Uh, but Julie, kind of take us back to um, when did you get started? What were you doing before you got into the short-term rental space? Yeah, yeah, sure. And it just, you know, it's not that long ago. It's 2016, November, 2016. So not even five years ago has my life completely changed. It's done right. a full 360. So prior to November, 2016, I had done a variety of jobs. First job ever was feeding crocodiles in the wild. If anyone's seen Crocodile Dundee, that was oh based on my dad. <laughs> That's um, amazing. So yes, I've still got all 10 fingers, uh, but feeding crocodiles. Uh, look, I, I studied hospitality at university. Could finish that thinking it was like a, a housewife course. So obviously didn't want to go into hospitality. What a terrible thing that would have been. Right. Um, came across to America. I worked in, uh, in America for 18 months promoting Australia as a tourism destination. Okay. Um, went into, oh gosh, tourism. Uh, I, when I came back to Australia, I got into, um, well, I was a serial entrepreneur. I tried every business from a secretarial business to a uh, errand running service. So it was Uber Eats before its time. I was going out and getting drunk people there, McDonald's. Um, <laughs> and then I uh, got into advertising, those old phone books that you would have seen at your grandma's house. Uh, I was selling advertising in phone books and did that for 10 years, which was super successful and a great corporate life. Um, but that pull and that urge to get back into running something myself was pretty strong. While I had been working in that corporate lifestyle, however, I had built up um, a, quite a substantial property portfolio. I was a single mum at the time when I bought my first property um, and actually everything's in the book, but here's the sneak peek. You don't need to buy the book, I'll tell you right now. Um, <laughs> is that I built, <laughs> built up all these properties. I had a portfolio of properties, but then I had a real love of real estate. So I decided to uh, get qualified. I became a real estate agent and um, I ended up sitting in open homes on the weekend, bored. <laughs> I was so bored. Okay. I just thought I'm dealing with property investors who are selling for a loss because our market had been very flat. Mm, right. And uh, Or they were looking to lease their properties long term to tenants who were going to trash their property and they weren't going to make any money. So they, I wasn't dealing with happy customers. And at the time, one of my properties became vacant. I had a one bedroom apartment the tenant moved out. It was already furnished. So I thought 2016, I thought, what's this Airbnb thing that they're all right. talking about? What okay. is the fuss about? So put on uh, the Wi-Fi, threw in some linen, 
filled up the fridge like it was a mini bar. I thought that's what you had to do to impress guests on Airbnb, right? So I had sodas, I had crisps, I had chocolates. I spoiled my first few cut, my first few guests, <laughs> um, which I realized I didn't need to do. I just needed to offer good service. Right. Uh, I went from making well, cl close to $1,000 a month was what I was clearing with my long-term tenant. I then went to $2,500 a month with Airbnb and wow. light bulbs went off, but it wasn't the business concept. I, Airbnb, I fell in love with Airbnb straight away. I loved the guests, loved the whole process. It wasn't until I had a property investor that came to me looking to buy a positive cash flow property. And I put it in air quotes because it's like talking about a unicorn. How many positive cash flow properties are out in the marketplace these days? Not many. So. I had to disappoint her as her realtor. I said, look, I'm really sorry. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to find any, but let's create one. So let's go out and find you a property. You want a vacation in yourself. So we did. So we went and had a look at a whole bunch of them. She chose one. Cha-ching. I sold it. Then I said, it's empty. We need to furnish it. You don't live in the city. You live interstate. I'll furnish it for you. I'll run around, nice. Kmart, Target, get the Allen key out, put the flat pack furniture together, but I'm going to charge you a fee. Cha-ching, income stream number two. There you go. And then I said to her, look, I've had really great success on Airbnb. Do you want me to manage your property on Airbnb for you? I'll manage the process. I will look oh, after Oh, everything. by the way. <laughs> oh, by the way, I have an idea. And uh, she agreed. So cha-ching, income stream number three, I was becoming a, an Airbnb property manager by with that first property. The process worked so well. She made so much money and loved the fact that she could come and use the property herself at any time. She rang me six months later and said, Julie, do it again. So yes. I went and bought her another property. She still hasn't seen that second property, but that was 2016, November, 2016. Okay. Over a period of two and a half years, I built up to 130 properties, oh. uh, $8 million income on Airbnb blew my mind. I mean, I wrote that book Million Dollar Host when I hit my first million. I should have waited six months later yeah. and written the multi-million dollar host, right? So there you go. Um, <laughs> Rebranding. So another reason to sell another book. <laughs> well, there you go. Maybe we've got yeah. a second book coming out. But um, but I guess it got to a point where I did write the book. The book became a bestseller. So it went around, it's a bestseller on Amazon. It's done very well and it's attracted a lot of attention. And I started getting opportunities like this to talk about my story and loved it. We had a conversation when we were in Arizona and I could just see like how excited you were about Airbnb. And I see you posting a lot more on your Instagram now about Airbnb. And um, you, you have the, the Airbnb bug is what I call it. I, once you get that bug, like you're just like, oh my gosh, how do I go get the next one? So, so for someone who used to have 50 rentals, I don't know how many you have now, but you know, and you, you were doing the long-term thing. Tell me why you got so excited about Airbnb being an, an older school thinker um, with longer term rentals. Absolutely. So, um, you know, I'm big into mentor and learning and networking. So one of the guys who I, he, he's from Canada, actually, Quebec. And so I bought a deal from him like 12 years ago. It was his first wholesale deal. He knew nothing really about real estate. This was in uh, West Phoenix. And so that was about 12 years ago. And then about nine years ago, he hopped in into the short-term rentals. And he's also a luxury realtor now here in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So um, he kept telling me how amazing like everything was going with the short-term stuff. So he has them in Quebec, Palm Springs, um, Central Phoenix, he's really big. And so I, I, I picked his brain um, about a year ago, and then we were having lunch and he's like, Hey, you know, flip, I got a deal. Uh, the doctor and his wife are divorcing and they're going to sell this unit, which is an already functioning Airbnb near Sky Harbor, Phoenix airport. You want to go look at it after lunch? I'm like, absolutely. I went and saw it. Um, he told me the price. He said, you got to pay close to retail, which I'm not used to, but 
They sent me the financials and I was like, let's do it. So I paid 189 for that first um, townhome in Phoenix. Nice. And that was one year ago, January 20, 2020. Okay. Got it. What, what was it that he was sharing or showing you um, that made you so excited about Airbnb? I mean, you know, I'm used to um, long-term rentals. So you throw a tenant in there, they may stay a year, two years in Arizona, um, maybe five years if you're lucky. Um, I had everything streamlined on my rental, so I wasn't really touching anything. The money would go into separate accounts. Everything, you know, third-party title agency would handle payments. But, um, I mean, that unit in Phoenix, let's say, so you do a search. Yeah, I could get 1300 bucks a month rent on there. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, all right, my mortgage is 900 a thousand, uh, whatever, 1000 say, for uh, HOA mortgage, everything. So I'm cash flowing 300 That's like it's nothing. Tight. yeah. Yeah, compared to Airbnb, where you're now making 200 bucks, 220, 240 a day. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm not that smart. So, I'm, I mean, numbers are numbers, right? So, I was like, holy cow, this is this real? Is, yeah. this, is this really going to work? Um, so, I got that first one and closed on it. Um, and like a week later, like I mentioned to you, we had our first guest. And I'm like, man, that's, that's pretty sweet. Cause it was already set up by Airbnb. All I did was buy a new couch and it was ready to roll. Right. That's awesome. So, you know, people ask me all the time, okay, you know, how much more can I make with Airbnb than a regular rental? Um, you just threw out some numbers there. Would you say that compared to the maybe $300 you'd be doing as a long-term rental is Airbnb three X in that five X in that? Like what, what's the number? at? Um, yeah, I was, when I, you know, I'm big into the numbers. So I, I'm seeing about three X right now and that's, I'm pretty conservative and that's yeah. conservative numbers. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to go through this whole year with some new Airbnbs, that first one, um, and kind of really see where the numbers lie. Um, but I mean, that, to get those emails, wake up, yeah, you got 1400 bucks in your account. I mean, it's pretty, pretty sweet. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? I mean, to me, the word that comes to mind, Flip, is acceleration. Uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. It just, when, you know, and, and I think going back to when I first was getting into Airbnb, and I was around a lot of investors who were, you know, bragging about $200, $300 per month at 20, 30, 40 places, um, I was like, holy cow, you know, I'm doing like three Airbnbs at this point and making $3,000 a month. It's taking these guys like 10 12 places to do that. And I'm doing it with three. And, yeah. um, and I think, you know, it, it's the acceleration is just so exciting to see. Wouldn't you say? I agree, Kyle. It seems like the antiquated way is to buy a home, sit on it, let it appreciate, get two, $300. I mean, to me, that's old school. Like yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm missing something <laughs> or what, because it's, 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 freaking amazing and so i got a goal of four years to have uh 32 airbnbs uh the next four years and nice. i mean the math is insane what you're cash flowing every month one difference and what i love about this business is that there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat um the way in which I teach is get into arbitrage and then eventually that builds your resume to be able to get to co-hosting. Uh, but you actually went straight into co-hosting after seeing a success with one property. Um, so I would say, I actually, I would ask if someone is sitting here and saying, you know, I don't have enough money to even furnish my own place, even if I got it as arbitrage and not even owning it. And so that's really difficult for me to wrap my mind around how to be able to talk to a, a landlord or a homeowner about how I can do this for them if I've never done it for anyone else. Um, what, what advice would you give that person? So what I tell people is first off, start with family and friends because yeah. business is all people do business with people that they know, like, and trust. Okay. So start with them first 
first off, you got to get educated. Nobody's just going to give you a property just because you present them an idea. They have to feel comfortable that you know what you're actually talking about. If you don't, you're not going to get the deal. So, you know, take Kyle's free course, like listen to the podcast. I'll plug my podcast at the end, like get a mentor and leverage your mentor's credibility, right? So like my students, they all throw my mug on their websites as their board of advisors. So they can leverage my credibility for their portfolio, Yeah. right? So first step is getting educated, whether it's free content, paid content, whatever, you need to learn the business, then start with your inner circle first and then do the cold outreach. Yeah, I, I love that. That's, that's exactly what I say too. I, and, and I learned that just like to me, you probably learned that before you ever got into Airbnb from a different job. I, I did the same thing. I feel like there was so many different things that helped me to be able to learn these skills so that when Airbnb came around, I was able to then use those skills. What, what kinds of things did you develop? I mean, did you develop a lot of these things because of Airbnb being the business or did you have a lot of these skills already? I think I developed a lot of them when I got in. Mm. Right. And it's awesome. I mean, I was, I was an accountant. I was not good with presentations or sales, but I joined Toastmasters. I joined a BNI group. I learned how to pitch and present and get comfortable speaking in front of people. And I put in a lot of reps. Like it sounds like, you know, everything is smooth sailing, but you get, you got to put in the work to master your craft. If you, if you really want to take it to the next level. And I didn't know anybody in real estate. Like my parents weren't real estate investors. I didn't know any friends in real estate. So I just said, okay, how can I get around real estate investors and build some trust? Right. So it was just leveraging like meetups or online meetups or bigger pockets or any resources where real estate investors congregated and then educate them on this opportunity. And if I gave good value, it built trust with them. And I didn't ask for anything in return initially, but then it was like, okay, then they'd want to work with me. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Okay. So the boutique hotel really has my interest. I want to know more about that deal. Can you take us back to how you got it, how you set it up, the, the whole nine yards? Yeah. So going back to what we talked about referrals. So one of my clients on the short-term rental side is a developer and he brought this deal to me and he said, Hey man, would your systems work at scale with this boutique hotel? Like, could we take down a hotel and you run it with these systems? And I went and checked out the property. It was really run down when we bought it, but it was unbelievable location. Like one of two oceanfront hotels in this coastal town, just wow. north of Boston. So we're literally oceanfront, nice. like right across from the beach. And uh, I said, yeah, like definitely. But I said, I don't want to do this for a management fee. I want ownership in this. Mm. And so we went back and forth a little bit. So basically I got two investors to put up the money for the deal. And I run the deal and we split it three ways. So I got ownership in a hotel because I got really good at a skill set of managing properties. So a lot of people kind of poo pooed the co hosting and even rental arbitrage because they're like, you're not building equity. And I'm like, well, you don't understand business, first of all. Yeah. Because if you develop a good business with systems, you could sell that business or you could parlay that skill set to get ownership in some type of whether it's a building or a hotel Absolutely. or whatever. So, Absolutely. Um, we found that one, my partners found that one, put that deal together. We actually got seller financing on it. Um, so we didn't have to put as much down. We put a bunch of money into the renovation and we doubled the value of that property in seven months Wow! by implementing these systems. So there's no front desk. It's all contactless, just like the short-term rentals. Every guest, anytime we get a booking, it automatically creates a code on the door for the last four digits of their phone number. Uh, we put in extra towels and linens in every single room. We give them beach chairs. I have some storage closets throughout the property that if they need extra toiletry kits or whatever, they can just go grab them themselves. Uh, my cleaning team restocks that every day. And um, yeah, it, it, it runs really well. Wow. How much did that one deal change your life? Oh, I mean, it was, it was a game changer. I mean, yeah. I, I, I put in my notice when I knew that we were getting that deal because I knew I wasn't going to be able to continue doing my full-time job and learn how to take on a full-time, like take on a hotel. Right. So that was kind of the jumping point for me where I was still balancing it. Cause as you know, if you have the right systems, this thing can, you know, kind of go along at a couple hours a week, a few hours a week, max, like with the right system. So I was still working a full-time job. And then when we got this, I'm like, all right, this is the jump point. This is the big opportunity. And I left. 
Awesome. So for someone like yourself that, you know, has a number of different properties spanning over four or five states, um, do you find there to be much of a difference in managing one hotel, which I think you said has 13 units. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So 13 units all in one place um, versus, you know, 20 plus units in four to five different states. How much of a difference or how much of a convenience is it to have all those in one place? Uh, I would say it's definitely easier for sure. Um, I will say from a, a hotel standpoint, I think you generate more cash flow from, if I looked at one room versus one short term rental, you'll generate more cash flow on that short term rental, but from an equity and wealth standpoint, it's not even close. Right. Like if you think of it, you know, we created seven figures of equity in seven months with that hotel. Like, Unbelievable. It's no joke. Like it, it, it can happen very quickly on the equity side and it's still cash flow as well. But if I make a thousand to two thousand dollars a month per short term rental, I'm not doing that per hotel room, if that makes right. sense. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, so it has its pros and its cons. But yes, if you there's pros and cons to both. The real work is in building your team, right? So once you have a good team, it's super easy to scale. Yeah. When you're when I started, it was like, okay, I got two units here. I got two units there. I got two units over here. So I was building a lot of teams, which is the legwork. If I decide to scale in any of those markets now, I can. Now I've kind of lasered my focus in on more of these boutique hotels. Um, but yeah, having them geographically close is definitely easier. But you don't want to get sloppy because a lot of people like to have it close but then they're the ones going over there to fix the toilets and do everything else. Like you got to be disciplined to say, no, I own this business. Yeah. I'll have a contractor go over there and spend that money instead of me doing it or me doing the cleanings. Like that's not a business. That's a job. 